A small mistake in the beginning can lead to a big mistake at the end. If you're firing a bow, an arrow, and you get it just slightly wrong, you'll miss the target by a long way. Now, a lot of what's happening today in politics and culture is as a consequence of the small mistake of liberalism. One thing to note is essentially it is the air we breathe. It's difficult for people to even imagine an alternative to it. In schools, in universities, it's the only game in town. Contemporary debates within modern political systems are almost exclusively between conservative liberals, liberal liberals and radical liberals. There is little place in such political systems for the criticism of the system itself, that is for putting liberalism in question. So what you see in the culture wars then is essentially just different kinds of liberals arguing with each other and that can be very profitable. What you don't see is an attack on liberalism itself. You've got people who all share the same premises, the same assumptions. It's just some of them are logically consistent and others aren't quite ready emotionally to go all the way yet. So what actually is liberalism? The true core of liberalism, the inner citadel for whose protection all the liberal battles are waged is autonomy. Autonomy is what the basic political principles of liberalism are intended to foster and protect. Live and let live. It's the impulse for liberty, conceived as license. Now, traditionally, freedom wasn't thought of like that. It was freedom to pursue the objective good. There's no freedom to choose evil. Aquinas said that the existence of evil is a sign of freedom, but the man who chooses it does not thereby actually become free. And where does this end? A person is autonomous if he can become the author of his own life. You do you. Make your own meaning, your own vision of the universe, your own vision of the meaning of life. And here we get into questions about autonomy versus reality, because you don't get to choose whether you were born male or female, and you don't choose the roles that come with those realities. Autonomy, though, requires that we are self-determined, the author of our own lives, not predetermined, i.e. born with a given biological sex. So let's say that a man wants to author himself as a woman. Well, this is where trans comes from. Our future salvation lies in a movement away from sexual polarization and the prison of gender toward a world in which individual roles and modes of personal behavior can be freely chosen. So if you want to be a breastfeeding man, if you want to be a pregnant man, then you're free to choose that. This is the reality of becoming the author of your own life. This is autonomy. Biology, if it interferes with that, is merely oppression. A social construct to be done away with. But the irony is that compared to the youth of the 1960s, the youth today actually after decades of being told to pursue this autonomous freedom, actually feel less free. They are more likely to believe that external forces are in control of their lives. And ironically, given that the greatest focus has been on trying to liberate women from the prison of motherhood, girls are the most likely to feel under the control of external forces. But of course, the real attack is on fathers because being a man comes with 
authority in the family. This is for physical and also psychological reasons. And that is where the real attack is directed. Being a stay-at-home mother isn't exactly up there on the list of ways to exercise one's freedom. That's not something that girls are really allowed to choose. You can't author yourself as a stay-at-home traditional wife. But it's really the authority figure of the father that is targeted most. No more fathers. No more people of either sex who have power over their children's lives and moral authority in their children's world. There will instead be mothers of both sexes. Now, while it is true that the mother-child dyad is the fundamental social relationship, there has never been a society organised on that basis, the mother-child dyad. The closest you probably get now is in the ghetto, and that is devastation. And telling men that they're better off outside the family is fool's gold. It is a denial of sexual complementarity and ultimately a denial of generativity, hence the falling fertility rate. Especially for men, this particular promise of happiness is a cruel hoax. Like all forms of narcissism, its final product is not fulfillment, but emptiness. This is because what really sets us free is living as men, living as women, fulfilling our natures, not fighting them. For more content like this, and if you don't want to be a degenerate, subscribe.